One of my favorite stories is of an American tourist in Hong Kong who wanted to buy some T-shirts. As we know, clothes are cheap in Hong Kong's many outdoor bazaars. Well, as he was walking the streets, he found a store selling cheap T-shirts with prints that he liked. But the tourist's fear was that the T-shirts may shrink when washed and not fit him. So he asked the store owner, will the shirts shrink? The owner didn't respond to his question, perhaps because her English wasn't very good. So she pointed to the sign that read in big letters, guarantee no shrink. Assured, he bought 10 t-shirts from the store for a cheap price and was quite happy and went back to his hotel room. Wanting to wear one of the t-shirts the next day, he washed the shirt in the hotel sink and hung it to dry overnight. The next morning, he put on the t-shirt and sure enough, the t-shirt had shrank and it no longer fit. Angry, the American tourist went back to the bazaar stall with all 10 shirts and demanded a refund. The owner shook her head, no. He said to her, I want my money back. I asked you if these shirts would shrink and you pointed to your sign which said, guarantee no shrink. I think you've lied to me because the shirts shrank. Still shaking her head, the owner said, no refund. And in broken English, she said, you Americans read sign from left to right, but we Chinese, we read sign from right to left. And read right to left, the sign clearly says, shrink, no guarantee. <laughs> so no refund. Often when we look at an issue or subject matter, we look at it using different perspectives, and hence, there may be great misunderstanding. The value and beauty of the Bible is that it gives us how our Creator God and Heavenly Father wants us to look at and approach something. Scripture gives us a God-directed perspective on matters that deal with life. One such area is how to love one another. Because while we all know we should love one another, many of us have reasons and excuses why we can't and don't really need to truly love one another. With the advent of social media, the vicious attacks on one another have been taken to another level, even among fellow Christians toward other Christians, which is sad and disheartening. Where is our love for one another? You see, my friends, it's hard to talk about God's love or Christ's love and share it with the world if we ourselves can't show Christ-like love to one another. If you have your Bibles, I'd like you to turn with me, please, to the Gospel of John chapter 13. We just want to take a look at two verses, verses 34 and 35. John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. And this morning, I would like to propose a new paradigm, a new model of loving one another that the Bible teaches, so that if you ever try to reason out why you and I can't love the unlovable, then perhaps you can be convicted and moved to do so. Now, before He left earth, Jesus Christ gave final instructions on how we as Christians are to conduct ourselves in order to effectively and efficiently do the work of the Great Commission. The context of John chapter 13 is that it takes place on the last night before Jesus was arrested, crucified, and died for the sins of mankind. Jesus, knowing He would soon be taken away from His disciples, tells them this in verse 34. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Now, you may be wondering, a new commandment? Wait, I remember reading something about loving one another in the Old Testament. And indeed, you would be right, because in verses like Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, we're told to love your neighbor as yourself. So how can this be a new commandment? It is a new commandment because the paradigm or the example has changed. It's changed from a command to love your neighbor as you love yourself to loving one another as I, God, have loved you. 
Our model for loving one another is no longer to show love to your neighbor as you love yourself, but it is now a higher standard. A higher standard has been set. You see, my friends, if the standard of loving one another is based on how you love yourself, then it is easy to justify why you won't love the other person. You may say to yourself, if I did what that person did to me, I would not forgive myself and would not expect to be forgiven and loved, so I'm not going to love them because of what they did. For example, a few weeks ago, we were all up late. Our family was up late doing various things in each of our rooms. And in our family group chat, some of the kids said that they were hungry. So Cindy replied that she would cook some chicken nuggets, which is healthier than ordering in. So she fried up a package of frozen chicken nuggets and left it outside on the table for it to cool and to be eaten. She messaged the group chat that it was ready. Andrew came out of his room, ate a few pieces, and went back to his room. I came out of my room and also took four or five pieces while watching some YouTube video on my phone. Unfortunately, my nugget allocation was already in my stomach, and the show was still not yet done, and I was still hungry. I saw that Nathan and Janelle had not yet come out of their respective rooms, so I yelled, Hey, kids, are you going to eat your nuggets? If not, I'm going to eat your share. There was no reply, and they didn't come out. So I took it as a no that they didn't want any nuggets and that I could have their share. So I ate another 10 nuggets, <laughs> and I left one because I was full. <laughs> then I left and went back to my room. About 15 minutes later, I heard a scream of accusation and crying because now the other two had come out of their rooms, and they'd seen or had seen that only one nugget was left and thought that their older brother, Andrew, had eaten their share. I came out and asked what the commotion was about. They told me, and I had to admit it was me. I had eaten your share. And then I said, in justification, I, I called you guys, and you didn't come out, and you didn't answer. And it's not my fault that you didn't read Mom's chat that it was ready, and it's not my fault that you couldn't hear me through your headphones. Sounds like a typical parent. And it's not my duty to go into your rooms to call you to come out. And what can we do? Then my daughter said something to me that kind of made me feel guilty. She said, Dad, how many times do we save you food when you're at work and don't come on time because, you know, because we know you will be hungry and you didn't even think to save some food for us? Hi, teenagers. <laughs> they have learned the skills of logic. Well, taken aback, I defended myself saying, well, I did think about you guys to even call you to come out. I'm a parent. I'm not your servant. You didn't respond. How am I supposed to know that you were still hungry? You were in your rooms. I don't know if you had perhaps eaten something else to fulfill your, ang uh, your hunger pangs. So the back and forth argument went on until Nathan, ever the peacemaking middle child, said there is fault to go all around since everyone's perspective is different and everyone thinks that they are right. And I said, yeah, and it's so silly to be fighting and crying over chicken nuggets. And if you want more, I'm sure mom can cook some more tonight. To which Cindy looked at me and mouthed, it was the last pack. You see, when the standard is each person's own perspective of how they want to be treated and loved, the standard changes based on one's own perspective. So, this is the standard that has now been shifted. Jesus shifted the paradigm to demonstrate an unselfish love, to demonstrate Himself what type of love He wants us to share, a giving love that is the love that God shows through the giving of His Son. Remember what 1 John chapter 4, verse 9 says. 1 John 4, 9 says this, In this the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. 
My friends, the model and example for how we are to love one another, couples, parented children, children of parents, amongst neighbors, amongst church members, amongst those on the fringe of faith, is the example that God Himself has modeled us to us through His Son. You see, the first biblical principle I want us to understand is that when we love one another, it is to be, number one, a love modeled by Jesus. A love modeled by Jesus. First John 4.19 reminds us we love because He first loved us. It is a love that He has modeled for us, which we are to follow. And it is not a love that is subjective based on how we think we should treat others because of how we love and treat ourselves. However, if you look at the context of John chapter 13, Jesus Christ had not yet died. So what would be the impact of this statement in verse 34 to the 12 disciples present? Well, if you look at the context, something happened right before Jesus says these words that would show the type of unconditional, sacrificial love Jesus was talking about. You see, if you read through the Gospels, you would know that the disciples of Christ had a problem all throughout their time with Jesus since their very calling. They jockeyed with one another about which one of them would be the greatest in the future kingdom that Jesus would set up. They were fighting for position. They were fighting for prestige. They were fighting for influence. They even employed various techniques to try to secure for themselves a top position in the future kingdom. Imagine the sons of Zebedee use their mom because could Jesus refuse a mom's sincere request? They used their mom, John and James did, to ask for a place at the right and left hand of Jesus when he would be enthroned. You can't blame these disciples, can you, for jockeying for position? They were just showing love to one another as they would want to be loved, and all of them wanted to be on top. Since Jesus was changing the example of how to love one another to point himself as God the Son, God incarnate, he showed them what sacrificial love looked like earlier in chapter 13 to the washing of their feet. And Christ exemplified a picture of sacrificial love in the washing of the disciples' feet. Look with me at verses 3 to 5 of chapter 13. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into His hands and that He had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside His garments, took a towel and girded Himself. After that, He poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which He was girded. Some of you would know that culturally, back in those days, the washing of feet was the lowest role that any servant of a household could do. It was relegated to the lowest of servants because of the disgusting nature of people's feet in those times. Just imagine, the streets were dusty, and people wore sandals without socks or stockings. There was no such thing as indoor plumbing or septic tanks. Waste, urine, and fecal matter were simply thrown outside the house and onto the roads. And of course, naturally, people would step all over these vile and gross things found on the road. Therefore, as part of hospitality, it was essential that each household would provide a basin of water for their guests to wash their own feet before entering the house. But it was a mark of great honor for a host to provide a servant to wash a guest's feet so that they didn't have to wash their own feet. That evening, as each of the disciples walked into the upper room that night to have their last meal with Jesus, they had most likely been continuing their argument about who was the greatest. And since they didn't see any servants stationed to wash their feet, and perhaps they thought that they were too great to do it themselves, they may have been waiting for Jesus to instruct one of the disciples to wash everyone else's feet. Maybe he would ask Judas to do it 
since he would be the betrayer. If I was in Jesus' place, I would have asked Judas to do it, knowing what he would do to me. Or maybe I would ask loudmouth Peter to do it for being so boastful and yet abandoning and betraying me that night. But it is in that moment that Jesus, wanting to show them what sacrificial love looked like, that He, the Son of God, God Himself, took off His clothes, got into the position of a servant, and kneeled in front of them and began to wash their feet. Can you imagine what, a, what must have been going through the minds of the disciples? Here they were arguing about who was the greatest in God's kingdom, and the greatest among them, the Son of God, humbled Himself and washed their feet. Can you imagine their embarrassment? And yet, how many times do we think to ourselves when presented with a task, this task is too lowly that I cannot do it for the Lord? Don't you know who I am? I have this and that position in society. I have this and that amount of money. This is the type of car I drive. You want me to do this? This is below my pay grade. How many times have we thought, this is too lowly for me? I cannot do this for Jesus. Late last week, it suddenly rained very heavily. And the rain was so strong that water came through the door through the baptistry and caused the activity center floor to puddle with water. I believe that evening there were four life groups meeting in the church along with a youth planning activity. And when I saw the puddle, I looked for a custodian to mop up the water lest anyone slip and fall. Unfortunately, I could not find one. When I returned to the area, I was surprised to find that one of the leaders of our church had found the mop and bucket, and she herself was mopping up the water through her own initiation so others would not slip and fall. I felt so touched and convicted at the same time. How many of us, when we see something that needs to be done, our first instinct is to ask someone else to do it? Or would we ourselves sacrificially do it for others. Would you wash the feet of others as Jesus did to show forth love? Or more realistically, would you mop the floors of this church in love for the safety of others? Look what Jesus tells them in verses 12 to 15. So when He had washed their feet, taken their garments, and sat down again, He said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Jesus gave this new paradigm of love, a new way to model how to love one to another, and he said it very clearly, love one another as I have loved you. Can you imagine what they were thinking? They would have thought about and identified with the sacrificial, humble love that their Lord showed right then and there through his jaw-dropping action. Their love for one another had to be sacrificial. It meant it would cost them something. Later on in their lives, each one of these disciples would have to come to terms with saying, I love Jesus. And each one of them would understand sacrificial love because each one of them would die for Him. My friends, it's easy to love out of convenience when it costs nothing. It's easy to love when it requires nothing from us but just a word. It's easy to love when it's not messy and we don't have to be involved. But a sacrificial type of love costs something. It hurts. It pains. It is inconvenient. It is messy. It is messy when you get yourselves involved in other people's lives. 
But you see, the second biblical principle of what loving one another looks like is that it is, number two, a love that is sacrificial. A love that is sacrificial. When you and I throw around the word love, when we say we love one another, have you and I sacrificed anything? As many of you know, I was in Europe a few weeks ago. My last meeting was in Paris, and so our family took the high-speed train from London, and we were taking a local metro subway train from the main Paris train station to our Airbnb with all of our luggage. Now, it had been a long day. We got up early to catch the early train. It was hot. The subways in Europe are not air-conditioned. We were all tired, cranky. It was rush hour, and the subway train was full. We had to squeeze our way in with all of our luggage, and Cindy was the last one in, and therefore, by the door. After about 14 stops, we were to get off at our stop, and I kept reminding Cindy of the stop we were getting off at because she would be the first one off. She had to get out first before the rest of us could exit. Well, we got to our stop, and as we were anticipating getting out, the door in front of us did not automatically open. And we looked up and down the train, and we saw other doors open, but ours did not. And the train started moving again. Oh, no. We had missed our stop. Again, it was hot. We were all tired, and we had been carrying our luggage all day, and now we missed our stop. Apparently, Paris has some very old trains where to open the door, you have to pop the latch. And we were so used to traveling in Hong Kong, Bangkok, Singapore, London, where all the doors automatically open when you get to your stop, but not in Paris. Well, we learned the hard way, and we were able to get off at the next stop, but now we need to get on the other train going the opposite direction to get off at the right stop. And the only way to get to the other side of the tracks was to walk up with our luggage two stories, cross the tracks, and come back down on the other side. And again, Paris, being a very old city, did not have elevators or escalators in many of their subway stops, and this one did not. The bags were heavy because, as you know, in all trips, as your pants expand with the food, so your luggage also expands with your purchases. Now, Cindy felt very bad, and we tried to assure her it was okay. And we kept saying to her, we love you, it's okay. But deep down inside, I was mad and upset. Thought to myself, it's so intuitive to pop the latch and open the door. But I was also trying to assure her and said to her, I love you, it's okay, albeit with gritted teeth. You see, just because we love her doesn't mean we and our luggage would magically be transferred to the other side. Just because we love her and love each other doesn't mean that some kind good Samaritan would come and offer to carry our luggage for us. Just because we love one another doesn't mean God would suddenly transport us to where we need to be. Loving Cindy in spite of her mistake meant we were all going to need to tiredly haul our luggage up two stories, cross, and come down two stories while all feeling hot, sweaty, and tired. And of course, as the husband to a wife who just recently finished her cancer treatment and to model being a good gentleman, I had to carry not only my luggage but hers as well with my backpack. I could have very easily justified it in my mind for me to say to her, you bring up your own luggage. This is your mistake. But can you imagine if I had said that at that time? I knew I would be in trouble for the next six months. So I kept my mouth shut. But the love that comes out of your mouth better show and accompany with it sacrificial action. Even if it's so very hard to love when people make mistakes and the extra hassle and how tired you are, like I said. When you say you love someone, it must be accompanied by sacrificial action or else those words are cheap and it doesn't mean 
anything. You see, my friends, a love that truly loves one another and one that is truly God-honoring is one simply that is sacrificial. A love that sees all people as God would see them. Jesus would have seen all of our mistakes and yet showed His sacrificial love. That's what He did when He gave of His own life for each one of us. He saw our sins. He saw our mistakes. He saw our transgressions. He saw our wrongdoings, and yet He still said, I love you, and He demonstrated that sacrificial love when He took on all the sins and mistakes of the world, ours included, upon Himself and paid the price so that we would be saved. Saved from being defined by our sins. Saved from having to be reminded of our wrongdoings all the time. Saved to start over with a clean slate. Saved to salvation. Saved to eternal life with Him in heaven. And if He was there at that Paris metro station, He would have been the one that carried all of our bags up and down. That's what sacrificial love does for you and me. And that's why I love the Gospels, because it is full of stories showing how Jesus Christ cared for those who were lost and disenfranchised. It showed how His love was supremely sacrificial to the extent, the climax of giving up His own life. That is our model. Now, why is this sacrificial love as modeled by Jesus Christ so important for His followers to live out? Look at verse 35. John chapter 13, verse 35. By this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Can you imagine that that is how Jesus said the world would know that we are followers of His when we show love to one another? It's not wearing a T-shirt that says, I love Jesus. It's not many years ago, a bracelet that has WWJD. It's not in listening to Christian music or even attending church that people will know that you are a Christ follower. It is in your love for one another that they will see that you follow Jesus. My friends, listen carefully. The gospel message that we are to bring to the world will fall on deaf ears if our actions do not show that we love one another as Christ has loved us. Simply put, a person that doesn't love one another doesn't have much of a Christian testimony. The world will not be able to see Christ in our lives. You see, the third biblical principle of loving one another gives us the reason or motivation to do what we are to do. Number three, to show forth a love that shows the world we are followers of Christ. A love that shows the world we are followers of Christ. On October 13th of 2011, you may have seen this, in a viral video, we saw a two-year-old girl who was run over by a van that then drove off, leaving her bleeding on the street in the city of Foshan in China's southeast Guangdong province. In this viral video for the next seven minutes, Passers-by ignored the injured toddler who was then hit by a second vehicle. More than a dozen people simply walked by the bleeding child on the street and did nothing. Surveillance video of passersby ignoring the plight of a Chinese toddler who was hit and run as a victim sparked international expressions of shock and horror together with a bout of soul-searching in Chinese society. At the end of the video, you see a woman then pulled the girl to the side of the street before her mother, a migrant worker in the city, rushed into the frame. Sadly, the little girl laid in a coma for a few days and died a few days after in the hospital. One blogger in Chinese social media networking site Weibo wrote, the shame of our people. Really? What is up with our society? I saw this and my heart went cold. Everyone needs to do some soul-searching about ending this kind of indifference. Now, before we so harshly judge and condemn, put yourself in their situation or that situation and ask yourself if you would have stopped to render aid. 
if you would have stopped to be inconvenienced, if you would have cared enough to get yourself involved in a messy situation. You see, outside of geopolitics at a heart level, it doesn't matter how powerful China is economically or how powerful it is militarily. At the end of the day, people want to see how we love one another. It is the same in the Christian community. It doesn't matter how large the church is. It doesn't matter what type of programming the church has. It doesn't matter the type of music the church sings or plays. It doesn't matter the facilities that we have. At the end of the day, the outside world wants to see how we love one another, how we love others. Because it is through the lenses of loving one another, the world will know that we are followers of Christ as Jesus Himself so clearly reveals. Perhaps, as the blogger wrote, we all need to do some soul-searching about ending the kind of Christian indifference we all see today. You know, my friends, loving one another is nothing new, but perhaps we've forgotten the simple but profound truth. Churches have tried various ways to attract people to come to church, even using silly gimmicks. But the Lord has already told us how to grow the church, how the church can make an impact without the gimmicks, and is to love one another to such an extent that the world will hear about it, see it, and desire to be part of a community where Christ's love is genuinely demonstrated. May we all do some soul-searching. Let me end with a story story told by British Prime Minister William Gladstone in announcing the death of Princess Alice, the daughter of Queen Victoria, to the House of Commons in 1878. And it's a touching story of sacrificial love. You see, the little daughter of the princess was seriously ill with diphtheria, and the doctors told the princess not to kiss her or breathe the child's breath for fear of contracting the disease that was ravaging the entire household. Yet once, when the child was struggling to breathe, the mother, forgetting herself entirely, took the little one into her arms to keep her child from choking to death. Rasping and struggling for her life, the child said, Mama, kiss me. Without thinking of herself, the mother tenderly kissed her daughter. And soon later, Princess Alice developed diphtheria after her daughter died and succumb to it herself. Real love forgets self. Real love knows no danger. Real love doesn't count the cost. As the Bible tells us, many waters cannot quench love, neither can the floods drown it. So my friends, how are you loving one another? How are we loving one another? Do you love people on the doorsteps of faith? Do you love them as they come in, although they may not be like you and you don't know them? Do you love people who do not like you? Do you love people who may disagree with you? Do you love people who have done you wrong? As a church body, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ commands us to live out love to one another and express love that is modeled by Jesus to express love that is sacrificial, and to express a love that shows the world we are followers of Christ. Have you, my friends, proverbially washed any feet lately? Are you still waiting for someone else to wash your feet? Again, John 13, verses 34 to 35, Jesus said, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. May the Lord challenge each one of us to love one another as Christ has loved us. 